Hello and welcome to episode 33 of the Green Bean Podcast. My name is Katie. This adorable little bundle right here is Jack and we are recording this in my studio in Devon in the southwest of England. Welcome! The Green Bean is a podcast where I chat about my creative projects, whether they be drawing, knitting, sewing, embroidery, whatever's going on in my studio. You'll hear a little bit about it in this podcast. And recording episode 33 feels quite special as a um, Lord of the Rings fan. Um, I know that hobbits come of age at age 33, so this is like a coming of age episode for my podcast. So I, I hope you enjoy it. I've got a little bit of um, painting to share with you, some knitting news about one of my designs being updated. I've got a little bit of sewing and at the end I'm going to chat to you about a another podcast that I've been really really enjoying lately and of course as always we're taking you out on a lovely walk out on Dartmoor close to where we live so settle in with a drink and a project and I hope you enjoy the episode. It seems like it's becoming a custom for me to always record at least one segment of my podcast without the microphone plugged in. So um, here I am sitting and recording this drawing segment for the second time and feeling a little bit silly because I was really pleased with the first take and uh, the things that I wanted to share with you. So uh, here we go again. I've been 
dithering and fussing about what it is I wanted to talk about for drawing in this episode of the podcast and I reflected on what that was about, what was going on there for me and I came to realise that it's because the podcast itself has changed a lot over the three years that I've been doing it um, because my life and my creative work have changed. When I first started podcasting it was really an experiment and something to do for fun alongside my full-time job. Um, my creative work was kind of something that I was doing in my spare time as and when I could and the podcast was also an as and when I could um, affair. But as things have changed over the last few years I'm very fortunate to be able to support myself through um, selling my work through my shop and through folks who kindly support the podcast on Patreon. Um, creating is now my full-time job and making podcasts is a huge part of that creative output. So the kind of the the priorities and the focus of my work is really different than it was at the beginning. And I share all this because um, when particularly when I'm thinking about drawing but also increasingly knitting as I'm doing more designing there's a pipeline of processes and things that happen to bring new products and new designs out into the world that often means that I'm working on things in secret before I'm ready to share them with you because you know there's like you can take a little bit of time to build up momentum for a new product but if you're somebody like me who gets distracted or starts something and doesn't finish it or um, you know life gets in the way things don't always come out on the timeline that I might hope or intend for them and, and I don't know I feel like that's that messes up my storytelling in terms of how I want to present my new products and new ideas to the world. Um, the example that I'm thinking of particularly at this moment is the next issue of my zine, The Green Bean, which I have been working on for a good couple of years already and it's not anywhere near ready for publication yet. However, I, when I was reflecting I did really think that it was a shame that this kind of idea that I have of a timeline of new things coming out into the world can feel really restrictive for me and what it means is that sometimes I'm working on things that I'm really excited about and bring me great joy and I resist sharing them on the podcast because I have some kind of sense that the timing isn't right and what I've decided is to just uh, throw that idea away you're here for the creative process and seeing how things go on behind the scenes and my intention when I started the podcast was always to be genuine and honest with you about how th how long things take and that means also being genuine and honest with you about getting distracted, not finishing things, starting new things and everything, everything taking me longer than I expect it to. So I'm just going to be embracing that from now on. And with that in mind, the project I've chosen to share with you today is something that I am hoping will become a new product for my shop. I'm not quite sure what it will be yet, but um, it's mushroomy. So I have a vague idea that I would like it to be ready for the autumn. But whether that's autumn this year or autumn in several years time I'm not sure but nonetheless I'm really excited about starting work on it and that's why I've chosen that piece to share with you today.
I can very happily share a knitting finished object in this episode, or a sort of finished object, let's be honest. It's a single sock, so there's definitely a problem there, and you can see it also doesn't have the ends woven in yet. But nonetheless, it is a finished thing off the needles, so I'm calling it a finished object. Um, and my normal rule when I cast off a sock, if it's the first sock, is to cast on the second one immediately. No fussing, don't leave it overnight, don't leave it for a couple of hours, immediately cast on the second sock in order to avoid second sock syndrome. However, I have broken that rule this time and I may live to regret it. But the reason is that I needed to borrow those needles for a different project. And uh, yeah, you, you can probably see where this is going. This might end up being a lonely sock, but I think it was worth it. Um, so if you follow me on Instagram, you may have already seen this project come to fruition because through the magic of pre-recording things, I've actually already finished the thing that I'm showing you by the time I'm showing it to you. Does that make sense? I don't know. Anyway, the thing that I've been working on is an update to my Scruffs cardigan knitting pattern. Um, this is a pattern that I published a couple of years ago. It's a gender neutral v-neck cardigan, two different lengths, and it has little patch pockets that originally included dogs. Obviously I did my version based on Jack and I also did the second pocket based on Dee Dee who many of you may know. She is also a Jack Russell. She belongs to Rachel of Daughter of a Shepherd Yarns and it's Rachel's beautiful yarn that I used for the cardigan. That's the connection there. But the pattern also included um, charts for lots of different kinds of dogs because I know that Although I love a Jack Russell, they're not everybody's favourite. So there were other breeds in there. There was a Spaniel, a Schnauzer, French Bulldog, Labrador, Dachshund, Greyhound. I tried to cover like a lot of different bases of general dog body shapes and expressions so that people could take the charts and then customise the colours and turn them into their own dogs. That was the plan. However, I had many requests since that pattern came out to add a cat update and it had been at the back of my mind for a long time that that was something I wanted to offer because not everybody is a dog person, not everybody is a cat person either, so I decided to include bunnies and guinea pigs as well. Um, you can see those here, we've got a bunny and a guinea pig and I just love how um, so the yarn that I used is Ram Jam Sport from Daughter of a Shepherd and it comes in five different natural shades. There's a black which you can see here and a white and three different shades of grey in between and I love how just using that really simple palette for colour work can be so incredibly effective. It doesn't even need to have any colours, just working in those shades of monochrome is, is really beautiful. And it's gorgeous yarn. Um, it's a woolen spun sport weight and it's made from fleeces that would otherwise go to waste. Um, Rachel buys them directly from farmers and blends them into these amazing colours. So it's really beautiful. It's one of my, uh, I would say, desert island yarns if I could only use a limited number of yarns for the rest of my life. Ram Jam is definitely up there as one of my favourites. I love how much woolly texture and character it's got. Um, and that's different across the different colours. They have slightly different textures because the bleed, the, the breeds used in the blend are different. Cool, that was a mouthful. Um, so what I'm working on right now is the last pocket um, example that I want to include in the pattern. And that's for one of those black and white Dutch bunnies because they're just so gorgeous. Um, so that's what I'm working on. And as I say, the, the update has already happened. Please enjoy these adorable photos of me and my friend Will modelling the updated pattern. So I'm wearing the original cardigan um, at the longer length with dog pockets and Will is wearing the new shorter length cardigan with cat pockets. 
Um, I think he did an excellent job as a model. I uh, was <laughs> very grateful for his help. And the update is free for anybody who has already purchased the Scruffs pattern. So if you've already got a copy, whether digital or paper, um, take a look in the back of the booklet. It's on the last page. Um, it was originally a Ravelry download code. I don't uh, use Ravelry anymore, unfortunately. But if you head to my website, www.katiegreen.co.uk forward slash scrufts it'll prompt you for a password and if you just put in that code there then you'll have access to all of the extra files and if you don't already have the scruffs pattern but you would like to make a cat or dog or bunny cardigan um, it's available in my Etsy shop as a digital download or a paper pattern um, and I've put all of the details for this down below in case you didn't catch that waffle that I was uh, going off on. Um, so yeah, I have borrowed the needles from my sock project just to knit one last bunny pocket. And um, yeah, we'll see what happens after that. My, I have good intentions of casting on the second sock once this pocket is done. Um, check in with me in the next episode, I guess, and see whether that's happened or not. While I'm working on this, I wanted to chat a little bit about Intarsia because I know it is not everybody's favourite technique. I'm not sure it's anybody's favourite technique. Um, it's certainly not mine. So why did I include it in a pattern? Well, it is kind of the only way to get like a one-off colourwork motif rather than a repeating pattern like you get with stranded colourwork. And you know, it's just for the pockets. If it was a whole garment, and I do have some designs in my head for whole intarsia garments, um, it would be a little bit more stressful. But as you can see, I've got uh, four working threads hanging off my knitting here. That's about my limit. I can't really handle any more than that. But you'll see I've wound the, um, the colours for the rabbit, the black and the white, onto these little miniature clothes pegs and I find them the most useful for intarsia because um, instead of having all of your yarns in your lap or your basket or whatever you're working from you can just release a little bit of yarn however much you think you want you need to use for your next bit of motif and it kind of keeps the rest of the yarn floating away off the surface but the little bit of weight to it helps with the tension so that's my top tip for intarsia yarn management is these little miniature clothes pegs. I'm not going to say that they're a magic solution. It is still a little bit of a headache of a technique because, uh, you know, you've got multiple yarns hanging off your work. So it's a bit fiddly, but it, this, um, this technique does seem to make it just a little bit easier. I'm saying that I've got a right tangle here. But uh, <laughs> there you go, it's not as bad as it might be.
I've been feeling a little bit stuck with my sewing lately, and that is since um, last time I took a break from drawing and illustration work, I gave myself two weeks to really dive into sewing, and that's when I made my, um, my pink tweed trousers that you've seen, and my green Fairfield shirt. I really kind of got stuck in and finished a lot of things. And since then, I've really struggled to make time for my sewing, but I think what also is going on is that I've been feeling a little bit intimidated by my next project, which is a tweed waistcoat to go with my pink tweed trousers. But I decided to be brave because I wanted to have some sewing to share with you in this episode. And I just tried to break the project down in my mind a little bit. I think thinking of the waistcoat as a whole was causing me to feel overwhelmed. So instead I, um, I set up my sewing space and just told myself that I only need to do one step in the instructions. Um, and actually what happened was when I started just doing that one step, my excitement got rekindled again and I did several more steps and made a significant bit of progress that I'm feeling really proud of. So I'm happy to share that with you. Um, so the pattern I'm making is this one. It's a simplicity pattern, number 4762. And I'm making view D, which is the one at the bottom with um, lapels. The others are just like a straight neckline, but I wanted to have a lapel on there. And it's my first time making a quote unquote menswear pattern. And so far I'm not noticing any significant differences between this and um, other women's wear patterns that I've made before. Um, but I think the, um, the fabric I've chosen is not necessarily the fabric that's recommended in the pattern. Although it does suggest wool as a possibility, I think looking at the examples on the front of the pattern, this is a waistcoat that's more been designed for like a dress fabric, because so I'm thinking of these kind of satin ones at the bottom. Um, and the reason I point this out is because of the modifications I've decided to make. So I want to show you the muslin that I've made first. Um, the first and most obvious modification you can see is the length at the bottom. Um, the right hand side over here is the length according to the pattern and the left hand side is the size, the length that I'm going to make my waistcoat. So I've decided to make it significantly shorter and that's because my pink trousers are quite high waisted. So I just felt the, the silhouette looked better with a shorter length at the front. However, you'll see that I decided to keep the full length at the back. And I was a little bit worried about this at first. I thought it might look a little bit weird, but I had a good Google and uh, mooch around Pinterest, which is where I often look for outfit inspiration. And I saw a lot of kind of tailored waistcoats that do have this feature slightly longer at the back, shorter at the front um, and a little vent at the side. So that's what I'm going to go with. And the other thing that I found a little bit weird about this pattern. And I think this is because of, as I mentioned, it being designed for a lighter weight fabric, is that the lapels finish at the shoulder seam. They just get sewn into the shoulder seam and there's no collar at the back. Um, and I think that's fine for a waistcoat that you're going to wear under a jacket. That makes perfect sense. But my pink waistcoat I'm intending to wear as a piece of outerwear on its own. So I wanted the collar to go all the way around to the back and come to the lapels at the front. So I drafted a back collar piece and I also narrowed the lapels a bit. Proportionally, I felt that they were a little bit wide for my, um, I'm quite petite on my top half. So I felt they were proportionally a little bit wide for me. So I drafted them a bit narrower as well. So here we have my finished collar piece, which I'm very proud of in a lot of ways. And also I've learned a lot of things from it that I would change for the next time. So I wanted to talk you through those as well. So first of all, the back piece I drafted from the back of the waistcoat, which has a centre back seam. So 
my back collar has a centre back seam. And if I'd thought about it, I would have realised that I didn't need to keep that seam there. I could have just cut this all in one piece. I didn't think about it. I just cut it in two pieces. So um, yeah, it has this little bit of bulk at the back that I'd rather it didn't have. But to be honest, it's at the back. It's not a big deal. So that's just something I would change for the next time. Something I am very proud of, which wasn't mentioned in the pattern, um, and I'm not sure you'll easily be able to see, but um, so these lapel and collar pieces are all made of like a top piece and a bottom piece. So ones that sit on the top when I'm wearing it and the ones that sit underneath. And I cut all of the bottom pieces ever so slightly smaller than the top pieces. And what that means is just that when you're wearing it, the seam isn't right on the edge, but it rolls slightly underneath. So you're not seeing a seam at the front of the waistcoat. It's just, just tucked away. And I find that extremely, extremely pleasing. The other thing that I don't find pleasing that I would change for next time I make the waistcoat is where I've done these shoulder seams that join the back collar to the front lapels. I would actually lower those next time and make the seams happen here where the little V is cut into the lapel. And I've actually looked at a blazer that I have and a couple of other waistcoats online and that seems to be more traditional. This kind of one piece lapel is actually quite unusual. And seeing the kind of flimsiness of this join here and you can see it's kind of puckering ever so slightly. I think if the seam was there it would kind of the bulk of the seam allowance underneath would help that have a bit more structure. So again it's not something that I'm so disappointed with that I'm going to change for this waistcoat but it's a learning process um, particularly about learning uh, tailoring techniques and sewing with the wool. It's all stuff that's new to me so I'm pretty happy to have something that looks great and I think it's going to be really wearable, but also have new things that I can take forward into the next waistcoat that I make, because it's definitely not going to be the last. So now that I've done this little step forward with the project, the next step forward I have to take is the welt pockets. And I think that's another thing that I'm finding slightly intimidating. Um, because, again, because they're self-drafted, they're changes to the pattern. So on the muslin, you can see, uh, look at this one, because I did it correctly. The other one uh, was a bit dodgy. Um, but the, the pattern just has these fake welts on. They're not pockets, they're just there for decoration. I am firmly not in favour of pockets that are just decorative. Like if you're going to go to the effort of that fiddly sewing, at least make it useful. So what I've decided to do is a double welt pocket with a flap. So an, a technique that I've not done before, and it's going to be a bit fiddly. And it's always nerve wracking um, doing a welt pocket because it does mean literally cutting a slash into the actual fabric of your garment. It's always a bit scary. So I'm just going to give myself a couple of days break having done this lapel that I'm really pleased with and um, gather myself to be uh, courageous and ready to do the welt pockets. But I think once those are done, then I'm just following the instructions to um, to finish the waistcoat. So it should be a kind of steady downhill towards a finished project once I get to that point.
thank you so much for joining us for another episode of the Green Bean Podcast. If you've enjoyed watching and you would like to watch more, please consider joining us on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Katie Greenbean. Um, I release extra episodes there in between each public episode that goes out and also occasional vlogs and extra content along with discounts for my shop. So um, yeah, I'd be really grateful if you can consider supporting the podcast. I would not be able to keep doing it without my lovely and wonderful patrons. So huge thanks to them. And while I'm thanking my patrons, it's one of them who I have to thank for another podcast that I've been thoroughly enjoying lately. Um, it's an audio podcast. I listen to quite a lot of audio podcasts and audio books while I'm drawing. I find them uh, like they engage a part of my brain that isn't busy with the creative work that I'm doing. So they're really useful and enjoyable in that sense. And the recommendation was for a podcast that I hadn't heard of before called The Strange Case of Starship Iris. And I believe it does have quite a big fandom. So perhaps I'm a little bit late to the party. But if you haven't discovered it, I highly recommend it. It's a um, it's a full cast dramatisation of a science fiction story. And what I particularly love about it is that it is it's not like a dramatisation of a book or a reading of a story. It is something that has been written for the audio podcast format and it plays to the strengths of that medium. And I can't give away too much more without spoilers, but it's really, really enjoyable. There's a diverse and queer cast of characters and they're all played by diverse and queer actors. Particularly, I enjoyed the fact that there is more than one non-binary character, all of whom are played by non-binary actors. And it's really nice that when there's more than one uh, trans or non-binary character, then they don't feel like a token. You do, do you know what I mean? It's really nice, um, the level of diversity that is represented both in the cast and in the, um, in the story itself, which I really, really enjoyed. So um, yeah, go ahead and discover the strange case of Starship Iris if you haven't. And if you do, please let me know how you get on because I've burned through all of the available episodes twice now and I don't have anyone to talk to about it. So give me a shout if if you do have a listen and if you enjoy it as well. And before we go, one more thank you. And that is to Will McNichol, whose lovely guitar music accompanies all of my episodes. Um, Will graciously lets me use his music for, for all of my podcasts and he actually has a new album called Miniatures which has just come out recently. Um, I was fortunate enough to sign up in advance and get an early copy of it so I've been listening to it for a couple of weeks already and really enjoying it so I recommend checking that out if you enjoy the music in this episode. And I'm going to have to go because Jack is starting to wriggle. But thank you again for watching and for supporting me on Patreon if you do. Take care and I will see you very soon. Bye. <laughs>